Good evening and welcome to this final session of Fiber 2021, Strange Relations. This session explores interspecies communication through AI and the arts. My name is Ruben Barth. I'm your moderator for this panel. And tonight I'm joined by three speakers uh, to explore the content of our team. So as you see, uh, the first speaker, uh, Spela Petric, is with us today in the flesh. Um, and Maggie Roberts and Stephanie Moran are on screen. Also, a big welcome to you in the room tonight. A uh, big welcome to the people watching from home. Um, for the people in the room, are we excited about tonight? Woo! Thank you. <laughs> Let's get into content. Um, so in order to develop a true understanding of how ecosystems work, we will have to step outside the borders of human perception and communication. For instance, through looking at how plants and animals interact with the world. Because one might ask, how do plants experience the concept of time differently? Or, how does an octopus communicate through complex bodies? So in this session, we will talk with artists uh, who use artificial intelligence and scientific research to develop new ways of interspecies communication. So we kick off the night with a presentation uh, of the collaborative effort of artist collective Orphan Drift, Ethic Lab, and an octopus uh, called Iskri. This is this is an exploratory, artistic, scientific, and technological project that aims to create an AI programmed by an octopus. So the AI will be generated from octopus responses to its environment, which includes a video stream by the artist. So it's an iterative process in which the AI will mediate between the octopus and its environment, with the result of reprogramming the video stream based on the octopus's responses. So this project combines video, animation, and text with newer tools such as laser scanning technology to suggest new spatial temporal formations and asks what kind of bodies might be possible within these new coordinates. In following, we dive into a collection of stories in which bodies and data become the raw material for speculative representations of plant life in the sphere of information. Relaying between humans and plants, we'll get into the artistic practice of Spela Petric, whose work aims to put forward a new and different post-anthropocentric bioethics. So after each presentation, we have time for some questions from the audience. That includes the audience looking um, from via live stream. Uh, so please join me in interviewing our speakers tonight. So this brings me to the introduction of our first two speakers. Stephanie Moran is associate professor at professor partner, <laughs> sorry, associate partner at AT Lab, which is a research and design consultancy based in Mid Wales. She works across commercial and government-funded projects for various industry sectors and recently set up its art division. She's also an art editor at peer-reviewed open access journal, The Ecological C Citizen. Stephanie has a background as an artist and a librarian, and she is currently writing her PhD at Trans Technology Research at Plymouth U University in the UK. Our second speaker on screen, they're basically together in one screen, uh, co-founded a collective artist called Orphan Drift. So Orphan Drift has explored the boundaries of human and machine vision since its inception in London in 94. The collective has taken different forms throughout the course of its career, currently collaborating with AT Lab to develop ISCRI, as mentioned before. So Maggie Roberts teaches critical studies at Central St. Martins and is a research artist at the AID Lab, which is Artificial and Distributed Senses at the RCA in London. She has presented at numerous symposia and conferences internationally and tonight at Fiber. So that's enough for me for now. I would say release the Kraken and uh, Maggie and Stephanie, the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Great to be here, there, everywhere. Um, so, yes, I'm Maggie, and um, I'm going to speak for a bit first, and then Stephanie's going to um, follow, and then I'll come back at the end. Um, so for Orphan Drift, our stories are portals that speculate on and immerse people in other kinds of consciousness, and that's been um, responding to evolving technologies for the last two get decades. Um, and we've come together in a super collaboration with Ethic Lab to develop ISCRI, which um, is the Interspecies Communication Research Initiative. I'm, first, I'm going to talk about the kinds of methodologies and ideas we're developing in order to think about interspecies communication in ways that challenge our Western assumptions of what communication is. And later, 
I'm going to speak about the role of making art for an octopus in this endeavour. So this is a co-created communication system that's not human language based. It involves two non-human intelligences learning from each other in an encounter devised and mediated by humans. And Stephanie's going to talk us through the project itself. We're not differentiating between kinds of non-human intelligence and in that we're working with an evolving synthetic or artificial intelligence and an animal, the common octopus. Both are ali intelligences alien to human and both are distributed consciousnesses. As Peter Godfrey Smith says in his book, Other Minds, the octopus is the closest we will come to meeting an intelligent alien. Where humans have a highly centralized nervous system, that of an octopus is distributed throughout its protein body with semi-autonomous brains in each of it, its eight arms. Their intelligence and otherworldliness has been the subject of human fascination for thousands of years. And as Alex from Ethic Lab, who's um, always monitoring trends as part of his work, says that octopuses are definitely trending again more. Um, and then also important, we're part of an experiment in communication, both as the human node in a triangulation between AI, octopus and humans, and also between ourselves. We're learning to listen to each other and to communicate across art and AI design and coding disciplines. We've, we, but we've come together both believing that interdisciplinary collaboration, really um, challenging collaboration is part of trying to um, learn other viewpoints. So um, Iskri, Iskri gives equal agency to art, AI and an octopus, but also brings together different kinds of knowledge systems, traditional interspecies communication methodologies, science through marine biology and machine learning research. And this is really forming a dialogue with many kinds of unknown. Um, could we play the first video, please? That's the last one. Not this one. Thanks. So we're combining two years of research into octopus perception and proprioception in marine biology papers with my working in Cape Town's coastal kelp forests with the renowned South African interspecies communicator Anna Breitenbach and BBC underwater cameraman James Luden in order to imagine into the life world of an octopus. James is here, you seeing he's filming backwards, he's moving forwards but holding the camera backwards, like trying to imagine like the way an octopus head is kind of often held back when they're jetting forwards. Um, and then he's um, using an extreme macro focus that's fitting into crevices and cracks with a, a new kind of probe lens, which is um, see in a moment, but that's capturing something of the tactile haptic world of the octopus. And Anna's telepathy and meditation techniques, which um, she's very um, knowledgeable about quantum physics and um, talks about the um, a feel, a sort of zero point field where everything can be thought of as entangled and that that's where um, the telepathy communication techniques move and it's held across all species. So the space she holds for us seem in the moment of communicating effortless when you trust intuition rather than the logical mind. Octopuses are so much part of the water they inhabit. Um, 
there's something about the combination of fluidity, shyness, playfulness, curiosity, mesmerizing skin color shifts and monstrous shape shifting. And color literally is a communication language that we can perceive as opposed to their chemo tactile sense, which we can't. This intimate touching of everything. Researching octopus embodiment helps us think about all sorts of intimate sensory language that can challenge our distance from the world and beings around us through our fixed figure ground navigation, perspective, representation with us as the center of our perception. Also, this, the octopus's embodiment that's inseparable from its environment is key, which Stephanie will talk about more soon. And bodies as prioritized sites of intelligence and a multi-sensory awareness and intuition as part of being, rather than our vision-led, self-centric meaning generating. And non-verbal communication and multiplicities of communication things that we need to remember how to access and use. Um, could we play the next video, please? So I had my first bewilderingly intense meeting with an individual octopus in actually in the Cape Town Aquarium. Um, and I've been snorkeling and free diving in the Cape Town kelp forest for a few years now, occasionally meeting octopuses, but mostly learning how to be in their habitat. Craig Foster, who filmed the Netflix award-winning My Octopus Teacher, dives in the same waters as me and told me to sink down and be still, feel the environment with my body, be respectful and quiet. And working with the interspecies communicator emphasised this kind of um, awareness and trying to feel into the octopus's eight arms which house over half of their intelligence like each arm is kind of semi-autonomous and then there's a ninth brain that um is is engaged for i mean we assume more intense uh, directional um decision making but so is greece work like imagining with an octopus and communicating with one in the mesocosm which stephanie will talk about but it's exploring physical emotional aspects to intelligence as valuable to both machine learning and to our evolution with non-human kinds of life and for imagining simultaneously individual and collective being and then um this diagram which we call the encounter diagram is trying to find language that we can um use specific spe make language specific to the project like you know what the, there's many words that are kind of um being used today in you know multiple ways of trying to address climate crisis and human centrism western human centrism um and i think we're trying to think about what it is in this in meshing between human AI and octopus, sort of a choreography. Um, Co-creations, there's no hierarchical difference between the three enactants. It's a continuous encounter, processes of becoming. Um, encounter in that we don't necessarily know what's, what's um, being generated or where communication's happening. But again, Stephanie's going to talk about that. Um, and reciprocity is important, um, a sense of respect and interaction without assuming we know what we're doing or having intention and goals, um, as most scientific experiments would. Um, and then on the right hand side, there's more um, detailed senses of what we really want to be doing. Um, Giving agency to the unknown is is something that we all are really committed to. Um, and traveling across knowledge systems and life worlds that I've mentioned. And also to think about meaning as something that's extra, extra linguistic, multisensory and aesthetic. I mean, that's a huge part of our 
um, conceptualizing and that everything's in feedback loops and all every each of the um, actants are, are changed in some way by the encounter so um yeah that's that's that and uh stephanie would you like to take over thank you yeah so we see um aesthetics is really integral to this in this experiment um to communicate beyond human language with an octopus uh, we define aesthetics as the capacity for taking pleasure or displeasure in an object or event or engaging in activities that produce or seek sensory stimulation. So aesthetics can be seen as a kind of mode of cognition, a way of engaging with the world that extends beyond practical motivations like the search for food or a mate. Um, so we can see that non-human animals uh, might engage in this sort of uh, definition of aesthetic behavior or aesthetic relationships um, and particularly octopuses are good models for this. They often engage the world in ways that extend beyond what's required for their individual survival or their species reproduction. Uh, next slide. So for example in animal biology, um, Burkhardt's criteria for play align with our definition of aesthetics that it's com incompletely functional in the context of, in which it is expressed, uh, so that it is spontaneous and pleasurable and differs from regular behaviour. Marine biologists connect object play to exploratory behaviour from which animals, including humans, learn. Um, and octopuses um, are regularly seen to play with objects. Um, Kuba et al. speculate from their research that play could be a byproduct of a complex nervous system heavily depending on learning and have the function of maintaining a status quo in times of lesser e ecological pressure and lack of stimuli. Uh, this might be evidence, for example, in periods of intense aesthetic activity across human history. As octopuses are solitary creatures, there's little opportunity for social play, but studies show that they do engage in play, playful interactions with objects. Uh, next slide. So, encouraged by this famed octopus curiosity and enjoyment with, of play, um, we hope that an octopus will respond to the artworks that we'll be putting into um, its underwater environment. So uh, it'll be housed in what, what's called a mesocosm, which is an ocean-like environment that's um, developed to keep an octopus in as close an environment to, the, to an underwater environment as possible, uh, so a more ethical environment. Uh, there'll be underwater screens and haptic objects, and the screens will be streaming uh, the film that um, Orphan Drift um, are producing based on our research into octopus cognition. Um, and then as the octopus responds um, to the film, if it responds, um, the octopus in effect will be able to program or reprogram the film through its responses, um, which are registered um, through uh, the whole environment, um, through sensors that um, measure, for example, color change, light, movement, water pressure, chemical changes within the whole environment. So we're thinking of the octopus um, very much as part of its environment and not, not um, separate from it. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is um, the system diagram. Um, so we're using a form of machine learning called uh, reinforcement learning, um, which, uh, which learns from unknowns. Uh, so it's it's hard coded to um, to a particular state which we haven't set yet, um, but it, that state might be a state of octopus curiosity, which we will know or understand better when when we set up the experiment um, after some observation. Um, so the um, the reinforcement learning algorithm um, tries to return to that state as often as it can. So so if the octopus is responding in a certain way. Um, it will try and reproduce that response or that interest. Um, and, um, or we might want the octopus to be 
completely still um, and that's the state that it's returning to um, but essentially the reinforcement learning um, motivates the uh, octopus to manipulate its environment um, in order to induce changes um, so the project is based on on a conception of knowledge and understanding as being embedded in the environment and the ways we've evolved evolved to perceive the world we exist all species exist in ways that are deeply entwined with the environments we've involved in how might an octopus ai reflect the different cognitive st structures of this alien species uh, next slide Through, for example, its distributed cognition, how might that be reflected? <laughs> it seems. Uh the internet is failing us tonight. Oops. Sorry. I've got a message. The stream's broke. Broken? Can everyone hear me? Yes, you're still uh, in the room okay. with us. Great. Perhaps uh, as we wait uh, uh, for the... Oh, there we go. Okay, right, I see. Great. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so the, so the way that they might sense, octopuses might sense light through their skin and see uh, the plane of polarization of light, which we don't really understand what that means uh, because it's not a sense that we have. Um, So octopuses have around 500 million neurons um, and more than half are in their arms. What does it really mean for your intelligence to be distributed through your arms, to be able to think with your arms? Well, we have a little bit of a sense of that in the way that our arms might move without us consciously thinking about it. Um, but to have a sort of semi-autonomous arm in a bigger sense um, uh, is a way to imagine into being an octopus. So by the end of this process, um, we'll have a, the AI learning from an octopus for about a year in the mesocosm. At the end of this process, we expect to have an AI that um, to some extent behaves like an octopus. Um, it has a, an octopus form of cognition and it responds to um, its environment in the way that an octopus might respond to its environment. Uh, next slide. So, um, so when we have this AI, um, this octopus AI, the next phase will be what we're calling mesocosm two, um, which would be to shift the experiment to a human environment. Uh, next slide. So that just gives a that slide just gives an overview of the the way that the con concept of the project links together. In the second mesocosm. Uh, it would be a, an art installation environment, um, a gallery environment, a kind of immersive human environment. So the goal for this exhibition is to create a space where the presence of the AI or the octopus is insistently felt in the room, something recognized as communicating, but in ways that maybe we can't interpret other than viscerally. An octopus-like AI will control what's going on in the building, in the space. It will have some kind of physical agency. This is quite speculative because we haven't done it yet. It's all quite speculative. Um, and become visible through its modulation of multisensory artworks and the human beings that are moving through the environment and responding to it in turn. The exact content and the relationship between the agents and the ways that these will be available for the AI octopus to affect will become clearer as the project evolves. 
we don't see the artwork as the exhibition. Um, we see it as the site of communication for the AI octopus. The exhibition won't take a stable form. We want the experiences to constitute the slowly revealed rhythms of an alien intelligence given agency in other environments. So thinking about how we might translate, translate a fluid environment where human physics, geography, aesthetics are thrown into uncertainty, perhaps using lighting and pattern to change the way people experience the environment, using light as a liquid, using sound. The AI will now be responding to changes in the environment that involves a high degree of human agency. So it will learn in turn from the collective analog behavior of humans in this new environment as detected by a new array of appropriate sensors and in the process over time becoming less like the distributed cognition of one individual octopus and more of a hybrid octopus human aggregate. And we hope that in treating the human participants as an octopus in a fluid life world, it may also reciprocally affect the human responses. Maggie. Thanks. So, um, yes. So we're prototyping art for an octopus based on the orphan drift and ethic labs multiple angled research into cephalopod cognition, the senses, behaviours and the envir how we, we, we might we need to navigate that kind of liquid environment and simulating the point of view of a decentered sentience of an octopus as we imagine it. Um, we're relying on the um, with things like Octopus in My House or various other YouTube um, recordings and podcasts by scientists that octopuses do um, register screen space as a, uh, a, a place of information and sensory uh, connection. So we're, but we're not only, we are also making play objects, like interactive play objects, and um, yeah, but anyway, I'm, at the moment we're prototyping um, things mostly in Blender and other um, um, 3D animation softwares. And we're asking what non-human aesthetics might be, and can we learn how to communicate with other species' aesthetics? So with the octopus, we're imagining a world where representation, perspective, central focus, horizon and gravity are replaced by pattern, abstract flows of color and shape, haptic and tactile sensing, multiple simultaneous viewpoints. Oops, sorry, I've lost my cursor. Um, and rhythmic pulses, visualizing the perception of a distributed intelligence that does not prioritize sight-led perception in the way a human does, but interprets the world as much through 360 degree touch, shifting light and dark, water pressure and chemotactile information. So we're building a thing we're calling the Mimic Skin Reef, which is lots of layers of um, different kinds of terrain and skin and um, color that um, emerges and falls back into pattern and um, can be navigated from through underneath. I mean, probably also we're thinking in the future towards a VR experience. Um, but so uh, we're thinking a lot about eight arm spatial awareness and being tuned to swell, ebb and flow and the camouflage techniques and relationship with the liquid environment where nothing feels static, even rock surfaces are covered in sponges, anemones, seaweeds and the shallow depth of these coastal waters means that in daylight hours the terrain is consistently and continuously patterned by a complex play of light beams distorted and refracted by wave motion on the surface. Um, yeah, and also we're 
another kind of unknown is we're um, working with accident, like putting the wrong kinds of physics filter onto a rock makes it turn into a cloth accidentally and then that feels a bit like an octopus um head and that and that has these moments of recognition or like illogical recognition that this is describing something um we wouldn't have intentioned is a, a an accident, a glitch, um, is a part of um, Orphan Drift's ongoing, long-held way of working with different kinds of machine um, technology and software of um, yeah, inviting this as a sort of generative space. Um, could we play the video, please? So... Um, the art teams, is that, yeah, assuming it's running, I can't see. The art teams translating and refiguring these phenomena into animated patterns and shapes. Um, Ranu in Orphan Drift talks about pattern as our first access to abstract non-representational language. Um, and recent research into cephalopod vision suggests that octopus and squid U and W shaped pupils enable vision based on chrom chromatic aberration and light polarization. In addition, light receptors in the skin register specific waves that each color expresses, either absorbing or reflecting them. So slowly we're generating objects, skins and terrains in patterns of polarized light that simulate this intense spectral information and chromatic signature we don't know to what um, avail at this point. Overall, we have so far a mimicry approach, like trying to simulate pattern, wave, camouflage, kaleidoscopic colour changes, skins as a sort of um, vibrating communication. Slowly we're spreading out into what a largely chemotactile sensorium might feel like and therefore look like, but we that's... Um, still massively in discussion. We're very aware that we need new languages. Um, I have a favourite text in Deborah Levitt's animatic apparatus about the importance of image plasticity that allows for a kind of animism she calls an animatic apparatus, the only appropriate fluid and plurireversal visual language for future world building. She says digital animation is a tool for moving away from the recognizable towards the unknown. It is expansive and questions subjectivity, gender, reality, materiality. It is viscerally intimate and neurospeculative. And we've been working with a Blender open source software expert called Megan Bagshaw for the past couple of years, building arms, skins, eight armed headsets, textural detail in the environment that becomes layer assemblages or geometric and synthetic shapes of polarized light. As Duncan Patterson, one of the computational artists who've joined Orphan Drift and the Iskri team, points out coding is about pattern too. We can interpret the marine environments in terms of coding, flocking behaviors, sine wave motion, repetitions, procedural, general, generative and emergent properties. Some of his computational art involves simulating octopus skin patterns using Alan Turing's reaction diffusion coding. And George Sims has developed interactive play objects with tentacles in Unity and Houdini. And as I was saying, we may have an idea of the sort of effect coding will have, but the result is always a collaboration with an algorithm and involves recognizing and amplifying an outcome that unexpectedly manifests an idea. Our art's comfortable in the unknown, the incoherent, the multi-perspectival and the accidental and wants to proceed through recognising rather than knowing. Um, so yeah, just overall to say we, Iskri wants to demonstrate that AI can be created in different ways and formed by different means. We believe in the urgent necessity of learning from other creatures, both synthetic and organic kinds of life. We think that Iskri's commitment to dismantling human centrism has ecological relevance 
And this kind of opportunity for an AI to evolve by learning from another aesthetically sensitive animal in its environment, rather than from human data sets, has great relevance. We are ref referencing indigenous perspectives on the interconnectedness of, of, of all life. Um, this is a good paper, Indigenous Protocols for AI, on the Serpentine's Creative AI Lab website, and my Becoming Octopus Meditations on the Orphan Drift website. So, we're thinking about effective AI being important for ethical AI futures. In Iskri, emotions are conveyed through colour, chemicals, touch and pattern. Drawing on the aesthetic and emotional behaviours of the octopus, using artwork modelled on its sensory, tactile and spatial perception, and employing reinforcement learning techniques, our AI will learn from a common octopus to create a more-than-human mode of effective, mutually dependent interspecies communication, as Stephanie wrote recently. So that's it. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Megan, Maggie, and Stephanie. Um, I have a lot of questions. Um, I will turn to the audience as well. Uh, but to start, um, you show that uh, octopus are actually a playful sp a species. Uh, they interact in social play. Um, so is the octopus enjoying your research? And how do you measure this? Um. Shall I go for? Yeah. Um, we haven't exposed an octopus to research yet. So um, we're working on watching them in their natural environments and um, through films such as My Octopus Teacher and that slightly bizarre um, octopus in my house work so yeah we've been immersed in octopus research for quite a while so i suppose that's really what we're in conversation with at the moment so 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 is it a wish i, I assume it is to expose an octopus to your work yeah yeah so basically what I was thinking, it's also a uh, speculative, speculative thought. I mean, the project is speculative in itself. Um, once you allow an octopus to program an AI, uh, I cannot help but think about humans and how humans uh, famously incorporate bias in our algorithms. Can there be such a thing as octopus bias? And can you then perhaps <laughs> continue this research, trying it out with other species, right? Yeah, we're hoping for bias. <laughs> <laughs> There's octopus bias. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> hey, and um, octopi are trending. Maggie, you opened with the statement um, of octopus being trending. Why, why is that, do you think? Well, uh, quite seriously think of them as an amazingly pertinent and insistent model for challenging us to think outside of our human boundaried um, Western models. So like we've been indicating a few of those things like the distributed consciousness and the sensory intelligence. I think loads of people are really um, aware that we need to change and we need guides. So there's that. And then also, um, they're just people loving really alien, strange, beautiful things. And they are all of that. They're like mythic and fictional in the real. I don't know what else you think, Stephanie. Yeah, people are fascinated by octopuses. I suppose that my octopus teacher documentary that you mentioned was a big... Um, was really big in terms of people starting to become interested. They're very smart. They're really smart. And they're interested. They're one of the animals that is um, sort of observed to look back um, at humans. 
So even like in the lab, uh, even they'll they'll be watching scientists as much as scientists are watching them, um, and they recognise people and they respond to people um, individually. So if they don't like you, they'll squirt water at you. But if they do like you, they'll try and drag you into their tank. Mm. Well, well, they'll they'll like to you know touch you. Yeah. Uh, during your presentation, I was also thinking about an octopus in an aquarium, which is basically a rectangular shape, like basically they already experienced the human world through a screen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are there yeah. questions from the, from the room? No, um, we might. Oh, we have a question okay. from, from the couch. Hello. Shpela <laughs> has a question for you. Thanks so much for this presentation. I, I think our works resonate in many ways, and uh, just from from actually, you know, uh, an experience already of trying to play through the use of an AI with another entity. Uh, personally, I came, uh, up, I bumped up to this issue that, you know, uh, algorithms are very reductive. Uh, th ultimately you have to pose really simple questions that are answerable by yes and no. And you, you propose that uh, this AI learns uh, using reinforcement learning from the octopus. What is the criteria uh, which you use uh, based on which the octopus decides uh, the algorithm should do one thing or another? Do you want? Would you want to go first, Maggie? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so essentially, we're creating the sort of architecture for an octopus to be able to recode the video. Um, so the AI. Um, so if you like the sensors in the environment, um, I like the equivalent of a keyboard. Um, to put it very basically, so the the sensors. Um, feed into the AI and depending on what state is hard coded into the AI, um, it will try and return to that. So that will, that will modulate the video stream. Um, and, but we don't know exactly how that's going to work because we haven't done it yet. So this is an experiment. Um, but essentially it is learning from the octopus's responses um, and that is feeding into how it learns to respond. So it Can I add? Oh, can I just quickly say, but because it's learning from the opt, the senses are in the environment and not specifically pointed at the octopus kind of thing. So that's a simplification in a way, like when we're talking about light change and water pressure, as in the octopus responding to the artworks will create movement or, um, you know, so they're basic things like rhythm and light and pressure that will be what's recorded not super complex um you know uh, arm expression or color change or points of interest the octopus itself has so i think what we're hoping is that yes the ai will um re it, like there'll be something reductive going on but maybe we're hoping when the um when it um has reached its equilibrium, depending on the precise parameters we um, encode, that it will, whatever it does back, won't be in the sort of rhythm or um, logic that a human intention would have. Would that be fair to say, Stephanie? Yeah, I mean, we're trying to, we're, we're putting the architecture there for it and then stepping back. So we're trying to, um, let the yeah what the octopus responds um dictate what happens um but since octopus no, i'm gonna um uh, due to lack of time uh because you also still have to give a presentation uh <laughs> sorry <laughs> um perhaps my final note on the people on the screen perhaps uh, draw up a contract uh, as the octopus becomes a co-creator of your artwork and once you might be selling it to a museum what does the octopus get <laughs> I leave you with that, um, and then we move on with other alien life forms, uh, the ones we found in gardens. Um, so, yeah, you already heard her, you already seen her. Uh, Spela Petric, a new media artist who has been trained in the natural science and holds a PhD in biology. 
currently working as a researcher at the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam. Her artistic practice combines the natural sciences, sciences, wet biomedia practices, performance, and critically examines the limits of anthropocentrism via multi-species efforts. She envisions artistic experience that enact strange relations to reveal the ontological underpinnings of our biotechnological societies. Jeez, that's such a bio. She has won several awards, uh, such as the White Afroid for Outstanding Achievement in Slovenia, the Bio Art and Design Award in the Netherlands, and an award of distinction at Pri Ars Electronica in Austria. Welcome, Spela. Thanks so much. The floor is yours. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I think we'll uh, have a really nice conversation afterwards. So, um, uh, yeah, I also basically a couple of years ago, um, we set out to make an AI that thinks it is itself a plant. So there is definitely some resonances with the octopus project. Um, and uh, tonight I'd like to sort of um, take you on this journey of how that idea came to be and what we ended up actually doing. And I use the uh, term we because it's not just my sole effort, uh, even though th I'm the artist of this, but it's really a collaborative project with uh, programmers and engineers and designers and even philosophers. So um, actually, I s my interest in plants started because of my personal plant blindness. I was really oblivious to them and that irritated me to the point uh, where I actually started looking at why we are so uh, ignorant of plants when they're kind of a constitutive uh, part of our ecosystems. And with this several year project confronting vegetal otherness, uh, I performed artistic experiments that would sort of uh, delve into uh, why the situation is such, like what is it in our worldviews that makes plants this eternal background, as well as try to make the relations uh, resonate in a different way, so to make these different constructions between plants and people. Um, and I, I did several projects that addressed different uh, scales, basically, of these relations, because it's very different if we're in a relation with a plant and we think of ourselves as an individual and we're talking to a plant as if it was like one individual being, or if we consider plant-human relations through a longer time span, like in terms of evolution or you know the advent of agriculture. Or on the other hand, if we look at plant cells and human cells in tissue culture. Uh, so in this performance called Scotopoiesis, uh, I enacted uh, the you know human, the individual human, and I stood in front of Cress for 20 hours, uh, trying to get this Cress to acknowledge me, you know, to recognize me as I recognize it. And of course, since I was casting this shadow, the crest that was in the dark in the shadow responded by changing its body shape, adapting uh, to the absence of light and actually trying to grow into the light. So at the end, we could see this proof of intercognition. So I recognized the crest and the crest recognized me. And um, even though uh, on one hand, this is kind of fascinating that there is such a change happening in a relatively short span of time. It also, I think, is a very anthropocentric project uh, because it requires, you know, this this proof uh, in the difference of color uh, in order to show that there is a recognition happening where we you know plants are so sensitive that you know you just kind of create a shadow like this and they already see it because they basically have eyes all over their bodies. And we know that from scientific research, <laughs> but here, okay, we had some sort of proof. But with the commitment of standing for these 20 hours, uh, not only uh, did this communication happen uh, that was based on biosemiotics and a physiological response, another type of refocusing happened uh, via uh, the... Uh, with the audience and via me standing there, 
the audience finally started paying attention to the crest. So that was kind of successful. Another, um, let's say, work that uh, delved into molecular communication that I did is called phytoteratology. It was about making plant-human monsters. So these kind of hybrid uh, monstrous or mutant species that weren't partially, uh, that weren't genetically human as well as plant, but they were epigenetically human. So uh, the, the way that this was done was actually using biotechnological protocols starting with Arabidopsis, which is this uh, tail crest, it's called uh, a model organism in science. And uh, through this procedure called somatic embryogenesis, uh, one is able to basically recreate the whole process of making a new baby plant from a single cell onward. Only this didn't happen in the seed, but rather in artificial incubators, so ectogenetically. And these artificial incubators were overflowing with hormones that are isolated from my own body, from this urine. So these babies that you see here are plant human monsters insofar as they were actually brought into existence uh, in an environment that was filled with information of my body. And this was, of course, done to sort of challenge these notions of, of kinship. But also, I ended up realizing that it was a lot. Um, it was a lot uh, about the biotechnology and how it construes the relations. So even though these were my babies, I was never really allowed to touch them because they had to be kept in a sterile environment and stuff like this. So it was kind of a threesome. I ended up realizing um, on the level of cells, another intimate uh, meeting was actually between um, single-celled algae called nanochloropsis, really tough organism, and another single-celled form of human, <laughs> the cancer cells of the bladder taken from a lady in the 90s. Uh, so they actually met in a Petri dish, and you can see here the algae and the, uh, the cancer cells meeting. And for me, this was an important experiment of um, having not only plants as m biomaterial, but also considering human as biomaterial. So in terms of tissue cultures, you know, cancer cells are sort of the, the place where all of uh, human uh, molecular capacity is investigated, right? It's where, based on these uh, immortal cell c uh, cultures uh, we develop vaccines we done we do all the the testing of um drugs and so forth so it is sort of a very strange um shape of human that is very much like a commodity already uh in so far as we aren't <laughs> uh but um that was sort of an alienating moment where humans and plants were already in the same type of level. Um, so, so from this point on, I started thinking about um, the relation between, bi because bio, biology, biomedicine, and biochemistry uh, these days relies so much on um, bioinformatics, so it's also about computational capacity that is able to digest this huge amount of data from DNA to metabolomics, proteomics, etc., to make sense of how cellular uh, uh, functions work. Um, that this, there's an intimacy between the algorithmic and the bi biological, and the biological is understood through the algorithmic, and the biological is manipulated from our uh, via the understanding that we gain through the algorithmic. And so this intimacy uh, is actually for perhaps for us shocking. Uh, you know, as people, we're uncomfortable uh, uh, when we are understood as basically statistical, a statistical mass to be discerned. But uh, plants have been observed and closely observed by machines as soon as that was possible, right, in agriculture. So here we see sort of satellite uh, images of uh, vegetation that is used to 
observe uh, veg just plant growth on a large scale. And these are some examples of robots that actually tend to plants. Uh, here we see some tomatoes, uh, our apples, um, some um, vines. So these replace humans uh, because of labor shortages, but it's also kind of necessary to very closely monitor the development of, of um, uh, the, uh, the uh, produce. Produce, and um, th although this is the reality of this uh, plant being, it is really uh, observed by these machines. We also tend to think of how AI would help us communicate with them. So, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, from this urbanite, uh, stems a desire that algorithms, AI, and so forth will allow us to talk to these beings, right? And scientists are actually using this in their uh, public communication. So we have the uh, twittering tree and the emailing spinach. And basically this is spinach which has um, been uh, fed or, or uh, injected nanoparticles and it can detect on a molecular level the presence of uh, I think residue of, of uh, like explosives and then there's a sensor etc etc so it's not really uh, I mean it's not like it has an agency to email but this is how it's promoted so not naturally uh, we needed to respond uh, via an artwork So that was uh, Boen Mort, uh, who is actually an interpreter uh, for the deaf and very proficient at reading lips as well as LipNet, a neural network trained on human lips. Um, and what they were interpreting is the stomata of this uh, Tradescantia zebrina, the uh, pink um, and silver plant, or inch plant as it's called, and stomata are leaf pores basically, so microscopic openings through which the plant basically breathes that also it controls quite precisely it's opening and closing. And here we actually do time-lapse videos of uh, these tomata with a microscope. And then we ask um, the AI and the interpreter to interpret what plants are saying. And of course, I mean, it's humorous, right? It's <laughs> sort of an apophenia. They're not really mouths, even though they look like uh, they are. Of course, there's also this level similarly to the scotopoiesis, right? Like we have the proof that intercognition is happening. And similarly here, we're insisting on reading lips. So as if plants use this kind of language, human la or linguistic logocentric uh, way of communication. Well, the fact that we have co-evolved, we are already communicating with each other through uh, volatile molecules, right? Every time you eat a plant, there's more than just nutrition going on, right? So there's this uh, humorous juxtaposition in this work. But uh, then onward, I went to think about what it actually means to have all these plants, mostly from the tropics, in our living spaces and how much we have relied on their company, especially during the pandemic. Uh, when everybody has, you know, including myself, I made a whole jungle there. Um, so I call them plants of Instagram. And um, they have, you know, qualities that make them good companions in our indoor spaces, which are really poor in light and uh, also um, have, you know, uh, not regular watering and stuff like this. So they are sort of like bio laborers. And I've been thinking about this tension um, between their bodies, which are their products, so commodities and friends uh, and entities that have a potential to uh, disrupt 
the capitalist system. And this is, um, let's say, an idea of how to do so. Uh, I will start with, um, yeah, just, just a clip to get you in the uh, mind space. Americans have Fitbits and pedometers in order to track their physical activity. But as CBS 4's Gilma Avalos reports, some people have figured out how to earn steps without ever taking one. This man isn't doing laundry. He's asked us not to show his face because of what he is doing with his company-issued step tracker. Put the Fitbit in a, uh, in a sock, hour and a half on no heat setting in the dryer, 11,000 steps, thank you. He's earning 11,000 steps without moving. As is the case for many employees, his pedometer is linked to company insurance incentives that can lower his payments. You are now more involved in, well, how much is this bill? Uh, how many steps? Companies benefit from a healthy workforce, and many are rewarding workers with freebies for getting fit. But there's also a growing movement online to cheat the system. We're starting with 3,472 steps. We were curious, do the hacks even work? So we ran our own unscientific test. This does still take some effort on your part to sit here and press this button for a while. Okay, there's a minute, 3541. That equals about 70 steps. With yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's actually very scary and very tragic, right? But this kind of monitoring, biomonitoring technology, when, you know, sleeping with a phone, it's already collecting data. And what is this? As, you know, there's a relation that we are willingly kind of partaking uh, that is outside of the scope of what we can see and uh, recognize. And I just think that uh, this is kind of an interesting uh, venue to introduce plants into this kind of biocommodity consumer market. Uh, so we made this uh, Vegetariat Work Zero, which is basically an installation that features uh, plants of Instagram that are uh, equipped with, oops, I just have one th this one uh, picture. So they're equipped with um, these uh, amplifiers that measure their cellular activity which is kind of like electrochemical activity. Basically, uh, we have uh, impulses and nerves, and plants have excitations that run through the flow M. So basically, the amplifiers tap into that, and then that is translated into uh, pressing of the drill machines, and the smartwatches are on the drill machines. And then these steps, which are not just you know noise, they're actually reflecting plant spontaneous plant activity, are then fed to this big other that collects all this data, right? And I'm just uh, sort of wondering uh, what happens with this uh, mistake, which suddenly represents another organism that's not a human anymore. It's it's a plant plant activity, and you know th what these companies are using all this data for us is to sort of figure out what drives us. You know, they're so concerned with our desires <laughs> in order, um, you know, they, they then uh, use us. Um, I mean, we're sort of the producing the data that is then fed back to us. So the open question was if we do this and the users are not humans but plants, what is the uh, algorithm concerned with, you know, is this a way to start recognizing plant desire? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and then finally, we come to this project that really connects with um, the previous one. So the last, uh, let's say, uh, the closest step so far to making a machine that thinks is itself a plant is to make an AI robot that it has one mission, and that is to play with cucumber plants. And uh, of course, all organisms play. It's part of you know this ontological play. It's it's part of being alive, uh, trying to figure out what your body does, what the environment is, you know, gravity, social interactions, and so forth. And there's no reason that plants wouldn't, because it's so essential. So um, tapping into some um, plant studies. Um, we focused on plants, uh, on tendrils, so the tips of plants which move around. And in this case, uh, the cucumber plants have tendrils to basically grab onto something. 
Um, but they have many of them, right? So with opposite each leaf, they grow one tendril, and this tendril has like a about a window of two, three days to find something to grab onto, and then it becomes functional. But within this time, it has freedom, right? So you would think that as soon as it touches something, it will just hold on, but that's not the case. It, it, there's a decision process being made whether it will hold on or not. So sometimes it like wraps a little bit around and then let's go for some strange reason. It prefers, it prefers blue and pink over orange. I don't know. <laughs> but we noticed this only afterwards. So our mission was to actually use this tendril action and make a robot whose morphology, whose architecture would be such that it could enter the perceptual milieu of the plant and also interact with it in, the, in a similar uh, architecture. So sort of mirroring it. And this is what we came up with. So um, this is um, LiDAR scan. We also use like 3D uh, scanning from autonomous vehicles, you know, the uh, um, laser that spins around and sort of continuously scans. Um, but we actually um, made a trolley that does like a um, 270 angle uh, scan of the plants and through this it actually uh, creates an imaginary of what the plants look like to it. It's not really a one-to-one -one image. It's this compressed, um, uh, computer scientists call it latent space. Uh, and it builds this through time. So every 15 minutes it takes sort of an image of these cucumber plants which are growing. And then when it comes to making a decision of how these tendrils would move towards plants, oh yeah, I completely forgot. The point is that we need a robot to play with plants because plants <laughs> exist in a different time scale when it comes to movement, right? And they behave by movement through growth, but this is slow. So of course the benefit of this AI is that it can also move slow. So it moves at like approximately one, you know, three centimeters an hour. So basically the point is that it decides which of these tendrils that end with bouncy balls to move and how far based on not directly the plant surface but the plant surface at as it is interpreted through the latent space so through its own imaginary imaginary of of the plants. And this is a super, super simple autoencoder, but we spent almost a year trying to come up with an algorithm that would be as open as possible so that we would encode as little presumptions about what this interaction should be as possible and really have, again, the plant teach the artificial neural network, right? And so when the plant actually holds on to it, that sort of sends a signal um, and it changes the neural network. It's also, it's a signal for the AI to stop moving that ball. So in time, um, what we actually experience is uh, this robot not only playing and poking the plants, but becoming sort of a trellis a support for the cucumber plants. And the shape of the cucumber plants ultimately is also um, imprinted upon with the robot, right? Because if it, if it can hold on, if it finds uh, a ball to hold on, it can grow there. And if it doesn't find anything, it'll just sort of lay on the ground and it will kind of stop growing or at least slow down. So this is uh, what we have come up with as uh, possible play between a robot and an AI. And of course, we named the, the work a very punnily <laughs> PLAI. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that would be it. Thanks. Thank you so much for this very engaging presentation and teaching us about plant fluencers and plant intimacy. 
and all that. Uh, what can we do at home? Can we also like play with our plants at home like that? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's 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 kind of weird because at first, before we made the machine, I actually set up just a time lapse camera and I tried to be these, you know, like uh, ha hands that move back and forth. Mm. And reviewing the footage afterwards, yeah. I, I found myself really feeling stupid because uh, you don't you don't have the memory of it, right? Yeah. To to know actually where it's moving. However. Uh, there are, of course, uh, ways of, as I demonstrated in the first work, right? All you need is just a little bit of patience. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> and and it's not even uh, with with um, these uh, cucumber plants, uh, the action of the tendril is super fast. So within 10 minutes, you can already see it wrapping around. So it's not completely inconceivable that you would actually see plants grow. Yeah. Thanks. Are there questions from the audience? Um, yeah. There's one. There's a mic coming to you. Um, I wonder uh, in which way the neural network is changing. The is it changing the movement of the balls, or what is the decision? And what would be the input for making that change of the of the neural network um, and so its reaction to it? Yeah. Uh, so, actually, can I can I have the screen uh, back? I will show you. Okay. So uh, hi what we have here is a this Z the latent space is where it sort of um, has this what I call imagination of all a combination of all the scans of the um, cucumbers through through time, right? And so every time, uh, every 15 minutes, it takes a new image, and this image is processed much like we are actually processing what we see through our past memories. It's processed through this latent space, so through this memory. And based on that, it produces uh, this image, like the eye with a little uh, mark, which isn't really a direct picture of the plants, but it is sort of a, an interpretation. And based on that interpretation, it sort of lowers the balls to come close to the plant. However, this um, 3D scanner it has really bad vision, actually. So the resolution is such it doesn't even see the ten the tendrils. So while uh, the aim is to have this contact, it will never really be able to approach the tendril just by vision. However, we hope that through time, it sort of learns to fill the gap. Because, so, okay, so here we have this eye, uh, with a little mark, and uh, so based on that interpreted image, we have a heuristic. So depending on what the color gradient is, it will lower the ball to so and so much, right? So this is coded, hard-coded. So it goes close to where it believes the plant is. When the plant, however, touches, uh, makes contact with the ball, this is uh, the C, so the classifier is actually the plant. And it actually then changes the weights in this latent space, saying, OK, this is where contact was actually made, right? So the ne th and that's how the latent space is actually changed um, by the plant. So it's, it's actually quite simple. <laughs> Super simple. Uh, I have room for one more question from the audience because for reasons of time and it's a festival and there's a lot happening, uh, we do need to wrap up. Is there another question from the audience? And otherwise I'm looking at Rianne if there are virtual questions. Otherwise I leave you with a closing question or I leave the room with a closing question. Uh, what might your research teach us in order for us to mutate symbiotically with our environment? The team of fibrous ah. mutation. 
I like what what yeah I mean that's it's really hard no I can rephrase it. I, I would I would connect uh, to to actually um, the first talk the octopus so I think that um, it's quite a, a, a skill so a continuous practice uh, to notice things that aren't immediately rational you know to sort of to to literally grow a sensitivity and then once that sensitive once you have it then the next challenge becomes um, uh, how how to actually capture it how to translate it into something that is of uh, like a particularly human mm. language because that's sort of the pro the whole process of working with plants now for mm. i don't know 6 years has been a lot of uh, first of all that being myself myself being changed by the plants and then finally seeing how do i actually communicate this insight yeah. so yeah that w i think that's small cool. steps yeah so everyone in the room go home and have a plant um, before we go out, I would like to invite uh, the artistic director of Fiber, Jarl Schulp, to the stage uh, for a closing note, uh, as this is the closing panel of the festival. Um, so an applause for now. And um Welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the wonderful uh, lectures and talks. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Ruben, for moderating. Uh, give him an applause also. A big thanks to you, of course, for doing Fiber once again in this great setting um, with a great lineup. Um, you are on stage on the first panel. Now we're here at the last panel. Um, <laughs> what are your highlights? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I cannot say maybe one highlight, but I can say maybe a few conversations that I find were very interesting. Um, um, topics about care were regularly uh, discussed. How can create? How can we create environments of care, where we can explore kind of the new ways we need to change this world, this this system that we find ourselves in, and uh, and and simultaneously, how can we create learning spaces? That's what that came a lot, and um, these learning spaces are not modeled in the way as we uh, see them now through educational models, um, but that's really struck me that a lot came about learning and caring. And this would be maybe a highlight for me to, uh, to, to think back to. Yeah, and this is actually only the start uh, of a longer trajectory that Fiber is going into. Uh, you also have a lab, so what can we expect from Fiber? Yeah, yeah, it's very good that you mentioned a lab because it's a very important part of what we do now. The lab has been running from the 25th, so Monday the 25th to now Saturday. Uh, it's the Sound Ecologies Lab and 17 international practitioners have been working together uh, researching through sound, the transformations of a landscape through the impact of uh, the nuclear facility or Borsela, but also industrial activities around that space. Um, and what you can expect from Fiber is that this festival, and it's kind of not a festival, or is it? Um, we're also in the middle, um, but we wanted to do an event that feels like a festival, but is a starting point. And our model is a bit that with the labs we prototype new works and we start new research that feeds into this kinds of events which is kind of a smaller festival and we build towards a festival a larger scale festival around may next year and um, thinking about caring for the stuff you do and the sort of sustainability and reg regeneration of things that you do we also take the theme with us so mutation will stay and we work from now till uh, march oh sorry may, may. Um, and we'll start to activate it. So a lot of things will come back. Also the lectures that we uh, recorded will come back, some of the conversations, interviews, and also other events in between. Yes, sign up for the newsletter, fiberfestival.nl. Uh, thank you all for being with us tonight and uh, mutate with us tonight. And uh, we hope to see you back in uh, May next year. Thank you.